Reading 76 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Uspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nichol. Great Amel House, May 3, 1947. A Note on External Considering A quite natural question was asked at one of the subgroups in connection with the last paper. Can external considering be entirely divorced from internal considering? External considering is always conscious. It is anti-mechanical and so requires conscious effort. Internal considering is always mechanical and so effortless. That is, not conscious, but the work of the machine. To put yourself consciously in the position of another person and see yourself in him and him in yourself is a conscious act requiring conscious effort. Internal considering goes by itself and is mechanical. Just cheering up a person who is miserable is ordinary human and reasonable behavior. But if it is a question of the work, and here the second line of work comes in, you have to listen to the person internally and find the corresponding thing in yourself. That is, to reflect the person in yourself as by a mirror, finding the same thing in yourself and not denying it, and then the other person will undergo a change of state without your saying anything. You do not blame, but accept, and by doing this you make room for the other person to alter. We have in the second line to make room for others. This is quite different from helping the person in the ordinary sense, which is simply the blind leading the blind. External considering demands listening internally and finding the same thing in yourself. That is, if you have sufficient self-observation and self-knowledge. You cannot influence others if you do not know the other person in yourself. External considering is seeing the state of a person and remembering that you were in that state. Because in the work everyone passes through the same states as, say, an older intelligent person has passed through and remembers. Intelligence means seeing the truth of a thing. As I implied, the mere finding in yourself of this state of the other person without saying anything will help the other person. External considering is a deep internal act and is based on an increase of consciousness, that is, on love. For all real love is consciousness of another person's difficulties through finding the same difficulties in yourself. Conscious love is not blind. This makes a new neutralizing force, a work force. So in a sense it is done in silence internally. It can be done even if you are not in the presence of the other person by inner work and by always finding the same state in yourself for which you might tend to blame the other person and perhaps nobly try not to and call it self-sacrifice. This is useless suffering. But when you are externally considering, which is inner, you must not show it outwardly Otherwise it becomes condescension, and so goes into false personality. To imagine you, as you are, can help another is always condescension. That is, it is based on the idea that you know better. You can, by sitting in your room and doing this inner work of external considering, this consciousness of your work neighbor, actually change the state of that person at a distance, but only by becoming conscious of the same state in yourself, and so seeing him or her in yourself. So you climb down, as it were, and do not feel superior. People will say, why is external considering called external and internal considering called internal, if the act of external considering is internal? Reflect for a moment, and you will plainly see why. In external considering, you put yourself in the position of an external person, 
an outer object, namely the other person. In internal considering, you think only of yourself. The first is objective. The second is subjective. We do not see people objectively. We see them subjectively, that is, as we imagine or expect them to be. We all do violence to one another by not realizing this. In this sense, people can be mutually destructive of one another. Now the fourth state of consciousness is called objective consciousness. The four states of consciousness as given by this work are 4. State of Objective Consciousness 3. State of Self-Remembering 2. State of So-Called Waking Consciousness 1. State of Literal Sleep, Physical Sleep These are the four states or levels of consciousness as given by the work, and we first strive to reach level 3. To reach state number 4, a man must pass through state number 3. Otherwise, he will get nothing. Recall nothing of a sudden touching of state number four. What can we understand by state number four? That is, the state of objective consciousness. The first answer is that in this state, we see things as they really are. But this definition does not satisfy the mind. Naturally, it cannot, because no one can describe a higher state of consciousness to another person who has never touched it. Unless we have touched the state of objective consciousness, we cannot apprehend it. Just as a man sensible of a three-dimensional world cannot apprehend how things would be in a four-, five-, or six-dimensional world. For instance, he cannot apprehend the idea of his time body, that is, that all his past life is living, but he can begin to understand, however vaguely, what objective consciousness might mean. Take what was said. It is seeing what things really are. The best analogy is a mirror. A good mirror faithfully reflects the outer scene. It distorts nothing. It is not jealous. In a word, it has no subjectivity. It shows you just what you look like. People say that a mirror does not lie. Now, if we could squeeze out our sentimentality, our imaginations based on false personality, our negative, subjective states, our so-called ideals, and a thousand and one other things, including our lovely pictures of ourselves, ingrained, hostile attitudes, typical mechanical reactions, buffers, prejudices, vanities, and in short, all the work teaches us to work against and separate from, then we are approaching the state of seeing things as they are. Now, to see another as he or she is demands one absolutely necessary preliminary, namely, the necessity of seeing what oneself is like. The more conscious you are of yourself, of what you are like, the more you will see others objectively. For self-knowledge gained through the practice of self-observation over a long time, in fact all one's life, after one meets the work, leads to you yourself becoming more and more objective to yourself. The import of self-observation is to make you an increasing object to yourself. That is, to make this thing to which you have been a slave, this thing you have accepted as a whole without question, namely yourself, more and more objective. If I see something in myself, it is no longer me. That is, subjective, but becomes an object to me. A thing separate, that I can see as distinct from what I regarded as myself. The part of you that begins to see yourself as an object retreats inwardly until finally it leads to real I, which lies inward and is your real self and is unobservable, that is, 
It is an experience that cannot be further made objective or analyzed. It becomes close to, but not actually. I am that I am. Then a man is master of himself and is no longer in multiplicity, but in unity. This state is very far, but it is quite real, quite true. This idea is expressed in the work diagram that begins with observing I and leads up to master. Let us look once more at the diagram. Master, real I, steward, deputy steward, observing I. One clear thing that this diagram indicates is that unless a man or woman establishes observing I in themselves, Nothing can take place in regard to their full development, which is the passage from the state of many contradictory eyes that belong to the so-called waking state of consciousness upwards towards the attainment of real I, which is, as it were, awaiting oneself. But taking what is not oneself as oneself can only lead to endless sleep and negative states so a man who attains to his real goal, namely becoming conscious in real I, is objectively conscious, that is, he attains the fourth state of consciousness. Let me quote now in brief what O said about the preliminary state, which leads to objective consciousness. In his experiments on himself, quoted in Experimental Mysticism, he says he reached a state in which the ordinary sense of I vanished. He says, I understood that with the usual sensation of I, all usual troubles, cares, and anxieties are connected. Therefore, when I disappears, all troubles and cares and anxieties disappear. I saw how terrible it is to take on ourselves this idea of I and bring in this idea of I into everything we do, as if we all called ourselves God. I felt then that only God could call himself I. Now the more you make yourself objective to yourself, the more you lose the ordinary, usual, worrying feeling of I. This is a sign that one is moving towards a different level of consciousness, the highest of which is objective consciousness.